Hello. Um, this is a um, follow-up, or this is a lecture in relationship to a presentation I gave for the um, diversity and inclusion series related to the Everybody Matters uh, photo project sponsored by the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. Um, my name is David Lowry. Um, I am a faculty member in BMS slash um, pre-professional health. Um, I am actually very pleased and I'm very honored uh, to have been asked to present um, if following up uh, as a follow-up to or as an addition to the Everybody Matters exhibit that is uh, hosted in the Shoal um, College of Medicines um, near their museum on the, uh, the lobby floor of the university. Um, I want to uh, sort of introduce myself as an anthropologist. Um, we as anthropologists aren't out there um, very much uh, in the public eye. Um, some of us practice what is pu called public anthropology. I don't see myself as a public anthropologist per se. I see myself as an anthropologist who uh, is willing and happy to work in the other educational and social contexts to, to and utilize my tools, uh, my kind of intellectual tools and my educational tools to help open up conversations. Anyway, um, so this t the title of this lecture is called Living in the Shadow of DNA. Subtitle is Making a Case for Real Talk in Science and Medicine. So I'll begin. Um, so yes, I'm an anthropologist. Um, this picture that you see now is not me. Um, this is uh, Bronislaw Malinowski, who is a acclaimed Polish, um, and I believe he might have been Polish-American, um, anthropologist in the early 1800s, early 1900s, late 1800s. Um, he was well known for his uh, being the forerunner to all modern, or to all anthropology really, um, 20, 21st century anthropology, and he was very willing uh, to step into native indigenous uh, communities um, in Africa especially and begin asking questions. Um, he There were some controversial sort of issues around his being in those communities uh, just because of a, a lack of ethics on his part in, in interacting with with the people he studied. But yeah, he his face and his image is one that is kind of tied into the minds of the people or kind of sh is showcased for people uh, uh, in introductory anthropology classes, or it's something that they think about when somebody asks them, "Hey, you know, have you ever had an introductory anthropology class?" Um, this is him, um, but that's not me. Um, if you will notice, um, most anthropology—he's he, white—and the people he studied were brown or black. And that's how most anthropology was in, up until the like mid to you know, to the mid nineteen uh, mid nineteen hundreds, mid twentieth century. However. Um, in the late 20th century and in the early 21st century, there's some anthropologists who look like me. Um, some people confuse me for Puerto Rican or some other national ethnic uh, identity, but I'm actually Native American. I'm a member of the Lumbee Indian community <clears throat> of North Carolina. Um, when Sylvia and the folks in the uh, department or the uh, Office of Diversity and Inclusion asked me to be a member or to participate in the Everybody Matters series, um, you know, I, like everybody else, had to sort of pick a statement about who I was or who I am. Um, for me, this included um, whittling down all of the things that I do, all of the things that I am, all the things I think about into a particular statement. Um, you know, in the age of digital media, or in the age, I should say, of social media, um, we often don't realize um, how important it is that we kind of come to a consensus about who we are uh, as individuals. It's really tough because, uh, especially in an online world, you can be anything to anybody. Um, and I think in medicine and healthcare, we're taught generally uh, that we can do anything and do and practice healthcare anywhere, anytime, any place. But I think, especially in healthcare, excuse me, we have to come to a sort of consensus, a sort of understanding 
But as humans, we are limited, and part of our limits as human beings is that we are grounded, we are locatable, we, we occupy one space at one time, unless you're talking to people about traveling dimensions, which is a whole different conversation. But in here on, on Earth, and this kind of earthly domain that we exist in, um, we are grounded in certain history, certain genealogy, certain cultural contexts. But anyway, this is me. Uh, my sign says that I am a survivor of the first Holocaust. Why did I choose this statement? That is the beginning of this lecture. To begin this conversation, we have to look at um, the history of healthcare and medicine. Um, a good beginning to this conversation is to look at the transference or the trans yeah, the transference or the, the movement between symbols in healthcare and medicine over time. Uh, if you look to the left, um, I actually gave a, lot, a lecture um, on this earlier. Um, I asked the attendees to, to identify what the picture on the lower left hand and the lower left hand corner sort of provoked. I asked them to kind of tell me what they saw. Um, one person at first told me they see a, a woman with hands wide open and kind of a sense of, please come here and I will help you, which is very true. Uh, when I pressed the attendees a bit about to give me more details, um, another person says that they see Jesus on a cross. Uh, so yes, they had, there was, there's a Messiah-esque uh, component to this picture. Another person says that they see blood red. They see the blood. And I thought that that was very on point because the American Red Cross, which this poster helps advertise back in the mid-20th century or early 20th century, um, is a, now a very established um, um, uh, organization for blood donation in the United States. But anyway, um, I, I, I was glad that the students saw that there was a very messiah-like or, or Christian or in general religious component um, to to this poster. Then we move up to the picture in the middle, which is ad, the, the advertisement or the symbol for Advocate Lutheran General Hospital, which is a clinical site for many of our students here. And I asked the students to look and compare the symbol in the left hand of, the, to the left of Advocate Lutheran General Hospital's name with what the picture that we saw in the left-hand corner. And the student pointed out that, yes, it, there was a cross in the middle, and it was sort of inside the healthcare cross, which is when, which I think in the 20th century was chosen as the international symbol of health care and, and sort of emergency care uh, throughout the world. So, you know, we've moved from this kind of Messiah sort of centered, religiously centered health care uh, framework in the early 20th century to now in the late 20th century, early 21st century, uh, a bit less religious, but still kind of a religious-esque uh, divine sort of notion of health care and medicine in the United States. Now, if you move to the picture at the right, uh, you have what is sort of the emergence of this new notion of of, of sort of symbology uh, in medicine and healthcare, which is the DNA helix. Um, and I think this is very, very critical. Uh, generally speaking, if you talk about healthcare in hospitals, when I was being born, all of my sisters and, and myself, all four of us, were born in hospitals that were either Lutheran or Jewish or Catholic. Um, all of the hospitals had religious affiliations now, and I think the DNA health systems is a health system in Pittsburgh, perhaps, I'm not quite sure. Um, but there are m more and more today you will see healthcare systems, or basically systems with, with that basically took over independent hospitals using some certain sort of more neutral as they articulate as sim symbols to, um, to kind of advertise their, their corporation. So here we have DNA health systems with the obvious DNA helix to the left. So why do I bring this up? Well, by my personal history, my personal introduction to this conversation um, is sort of an, an, an merging of both my history at my undergraduate institution, MIT, and my coming to Rosalind Franklin University of Medicine Science um, back to a year ago, two years ago. Um, when I first walked up, and I'll take you back to the introductory slide, um, the first thing that I saw walking in the parking lot was the statue of the DNA helix. And I was like, hmm, that's interesting. Why would a university put up a DNA helix? Now, knowing this history right here, where you used to have healthcare as this kind of religious context, uh, in the in the larger kind of context of U.S. and, and even world health, um, it was obvious that there used to be and was a religious kind of uh, framework for for pretty much all medical care. 
However, in coming here to Roslyn Franklin University of Medicine and Science, I realized that you know, there was no Christian, no Jewish, really, uh, no major religious context, but there was this kind of social, um, almost religious context built around this, this statue, this, this emblem, uh, uh, the DNA helix outside of our building. And, uh, and I was caught, not off guard, but I was surprised. Uh, it, it, it piqued my interest. And it took me back to a, a time um, in my early college education where I saw a lot of DNA as used in the context of, uh, or as DNA used to kind of emphasize um, the future of, of, of medicine and, and, and scientific endeavor. So we'll bring you back through. In 1999 was when I entered or started at MIT um, as a student. Um, 1999 was very critical. Um, if you, and again, keeping this kind of within this conversation within the context of religion for a moment, um, this was an article published, and it is still published on genome.gov uh, that identifies the importance of 1999 as the year when the human, human genome project really, really took off. Um, this was the year that, as this title says, scientists complete first chapter of Book of Life with decoding of first human chromosome. Um, in my live lecture earlier, I had questions for the students. What does this title tell you? Student so almost instantaneously told me that this title sort of has a scriptural or biblical context that the, that the author is trying to kind of propose. I don't know who authored the title. I don't know who wrote it. And I guess um, I don't see an author's name. It might just be like a general writer for this genome.gov project uh, website. But essentially, uh, this, this, this article, uh, the title of this article and sort of the content uh, is a picture in time showing that when scientists in the larger American sort of scientific community and medical community realized that the DNA had been, or the chromosome had been properly coded or had been properly mapped, that this was a transformational, uh, 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 almost divine moment in, in American and, and world education. We had finally conquered, if you will, and finally found, if you will, the truth within our human and, and, and sort of all biological existence, which is the DNA, uh, the DNA, or the, the ability to, to sequence DNAs and to really rigorously find out uh, what our DNA can tell us about our human and condition and, and biological conditions more generally. So, um, Yes, this was an interesting time. Um, I sort of had my own DNA time capsule. As a student at MIT, my first bio, biology class was taught in, I think, early 2000. Uh, by, yeah, yeah, the second semester I was there in 2000, uh, the course number is 7.012, which if you're from MIT, if you know about MIT, you, you know how the courses are numbered. Uh, but my first bio biology class, my intro to biology, uh, was co-taught by a man named Eric Lander. Eric Lander, if you don't know him, uh, was the first name on the first article published in Nature in 2001 that described and it kind of showed DNA sequencing. sequencing. Um, he was essentially the man, or the person, if you will, if you don't want to be gendered, the person at the forefront of DNA and scientific uh, inquiry, uh, or, or DNA inquiry, or inquiry related to DNA um, um, science and technology. And still today, he heads the Broad Institute um, at MIT and is a major uh, spokesperson for their work and um, and. Uh, I think he works particularly, in particular, on mice genomic sequencing. Now, on the right, in two, my class, my original class year was 2003, even though I didn't graduate 2003 because I took some time off from school. But in 2003, or uh, for the class of 2003, which I was, uh, which I am a part of, I always, we always claim your original class when you start at MIT. Um, each class designs their own class ring. This is the side. Um, of my ring, um, which I didn't have room to show you the entire ring, but this is the side of my ring. Now every year, I think most classes put this main building on their, um, put this main building, which is I think building seven if I'm mis mistaken. Somebody from MIT would really get angry with me because I don't know it, I don't remember it. But this is one of the main buildings at MIT and uh, essentially uh, each year the building sort of is shown. But this year, if you will notice, and I think you can see my mouse, if I'm not mistaken, uh, right here on either side, 
um, on the very left and the very right, the pillars were changed to helixes, to, uh, to, to, to basically something wrapped around something else. Um, and, and essentially, it was on purpose. The, our class and the representatives who designed the ring for our class said that, well, given what we've been talking about at MIT over the last um, year or so, because we designed these rings, I think, in our second year at MIT, I think we need to indicate that we acknowledge, or that we need to show that we acknowledge, that we came into MIT at, the, at this crucial moment and the kind of our understanding of DNA and DNA technology. So this was this was this was a phenomenal year, a, year, a, year, a couple years, and, and you know, I, I as a student at MIT took for granted what was going on, but this was a very very powerful time, both politically and, and educationally. And now Eric Lander, in particular, Professor Lander, he would often he actually came into our lecture the first day, and I remember this very distinctly. He says, "The world you are in now will never be the same." Um, and he followed that up with the description of what his role was, and uh, lo and behold, he was in the process of publishing um, a major article for Nature, which is a major scientific journal, about DNA. So we were hearing from the main spokesperson for the Human Genome Project, and he was entering our class, and the very almost first words that he said were, was that we would never look at the world the same um, after what had just happened. Um, and, and um, during 1999 with the Human Genome Project sort of being solidified um, as successful. But anyway, um, let me go back to the slide. Um, it was apparent, even though there weren't statues of DNA, um, I took my ring and my classes, my, my, my classmates' interpretation of what their life meant at MIT and the, and the kind of fact that they integrated the DNA into our symbol of our time at MIT. Um, this really started to show me um, how DNA had, was becoming a very, um, not religious, but a very divine symbol, a symbol of truth um, within sort of our conceptualization of the world. And I think Professor Lander was totally correct, very correct, in saying that we would never look at the world the same. Anyway, um, so my time at MIT really came um, with a lot of wondrous sort of experiences. You know, I, I was introduced by um, by people, uh, two people. I was introduced to people, in, including Professor Lander, who were at the head of this major conversation about DNA technology and DNA science. Um, but later on. Um, and this was before I arrived at Rosalind Franklin, I began to think about what is this backstory of DNA? What is the importance of uh, being able to sort of without any hesitation go into this new age that Professor Lander was describing and in, invest in it and sort of own it uh, wholeheartedly, uh, take it in and, and appreciate it without any qualms. Um, it, it was hard for me because uh, I didn't go to MIT. Well, I went to MIT originally uh, thinking I was going to be a chemical engineer. I ended up leaving MIT with a degree in anthropology, which was probably the most valuable degree that I could get because it allowed me, being at MIT, gaining my first anthropological training at MIT, to begin to understand the world of medicine and science in a very unique way. Um, and from the very first moments I was at MIT in a maybe in a passive way at first, but in a very obvious way later on, I began to ask questions about why MIT had so willingly opened it up its doors and its ranks to this human genome project. So it brings us back to the era where Rosalind Franklin, the namesake of our university, um, or the, the kind of image of our university, the time when she was doing research and, and on, on DNA and, and attempting through her X-ray methods to 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 kind of show what in my, to show what DNA is, um, we are probably all familiar with photo fifty one and how its X pattern um, kind of showcased what Watson and Crick supposedly said they knew about DNA, which people have argued that they didn't know. Um, her work was was seminal. It was it was important. It was it was critical um, to 
the next leg of efforts by scientists to not only understand and see DNA, but to begin to break it open and understand it and map it as we would see later in 1999. Um, but looking at her period, the, the time she was alive in the 50s before her death later on, um, she, again, there was several books written about her, but she's often, or she has been called the dark lady of DNA, and it's for various reasons. One of the reasons was because she didn't get along with this fellow, this person, this man right here. His name is Maurice Wilkins. If you don't know the story of Rosalind Franklin, uh, Maurice Wilkins worked with her at King's College in uh, the 1950s. He um, came into this job with her thinking that at first, according to various stories, that she was going to be his assistant. Uh, again, this was a science and, and medical community um, that, or science community that was dominated by a male chauvinism, if you will. Uh, but she wasn't going to be, she denied any idea that she would be his assistant. She was going to be a co-worker with him. Uh, as so happens, he sort of was put in the shadow of Rosalind Franklin. And I don't know how he took it. I don't think the history of that is really well written. But Maurice Wilkins essentially um, was caught in between several things. On one hand, he was caught between Roz and Franklin. On one hand, he was caught between Roz and Franklin and her antagonist over at um, uh, Cambridge University, Watson and Crick. Um, they, Watson and Crick, could not identify, could not properly map, could not create a model of the DNA helix, and, I, and, I, and it was, and that was sort of this notion of Watson and Crick were trying their best, and these are sort of how the stories are written. They were trying their best to find out what type of evidence Rosalind Franklin had gained so that they could perfect their model. And again, this was a, they, this was a race. They, everybody wanted to be at the, 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 the bleeding edge of, of this DNA science, which they didn't call it DNA at that time, but they had an idea that it was either two or three helixes, or strains to the helix. Um, but Maurice Wilkins, on the other hand, was not her antagonist. Maurice Wilkins seemed to be this kind of ambiguous character who had access to Rosalind Franklin, but at the same time maintained certain relationships with Watson and Crick over at um, Cambridge University. Well, as it so happens, um, this was a time when Maurice Wilkins was also moving out of his identity as um, a scientist in the Manhattan Project uh, during World War II and after World War II, and he said very openly he was very disgusted with the science of death. He did not he didn't want to have anything to do with it. He wanted to do the science of life. Um, and he sort of moved to the opposite end of the spectrum, and he thought DNA was that place, that kind of um, text, through which he could show that he was part now of this science of, of life. But we have to kind of back up from here and see that the Cold War, uh, what he participated in in terms of the Manhattan Project, paralleled what Rosalind Franklin and Watson Crick showed to be a DNA war. Um, and I think... Uh, Maurice Wilkins' movement from the Manhattan Project and sort of the science that dropped, helped create the bombs that were dropped on Japan at the end of World War II, um, his move to DNA research uh, was not without ambiguity. He is an entirely ambiguous man, an ambiguous person, and I think his move to DNA work was completely ambiguous because I think he was caught in between betwixt and between uh, because of both his weird relationship with Rosalind Franklin and his sort of not unwillingness to kind of take a side and really, you know, try to own uh, the founding of DNA, but also because he questioned sort of the future uh, of what this DNA technology would be. Um, so if you look at his history up until his death in 2004, he was lecturing at King's College. Uh, telling students, telling people who would listen that, hey, we, I helped open up this Pandora's box called DNA, but you all are in charge of controlling it because things can get really bad. And I think towards the end of his life, according to the stories I've heard, um, Maurice Wilkins really saw DNA technology as the equivalent evils and maybe worse evils than the Manhattan Project just because you, the scientist, can do pretty much anything with the technology and it was up to society to really control something that was not as obviously controllable as you know dropping as controllable as dropping a bomb 
on another country. You were really dealing with DNA technology and the ability to, on and on, and within large landscapes and you know across broad populations, impact health and wellness and life and death, uh, in in a way that may not be identified and may not be easily easily be recognized by those who are inquiring into why people are suffering and being affected in a certain way by certain elements of their environment, uh, i.e. GMO foods and people's uh, questioning and various people's questioning of how GMO foods are impacting uh, the health of human beings and, and other living things, other animals today. Um, but let me say here, I think Maurice Wilkins uh, is, is different though, and I need to emphasize this, he's very different than Watson and Craig, especially Watson who uh, I think heads or has headed, I don't, I, at this point I don't know if Watson's still alive, I'm assuming he's passed, I'm not sure. Uh, but Watson, uh, at least in the early 2000s, uh, was leading a genomic center uh, somewhere. Um, and I saw one film where he had this st giant statue of a DNA in the front lawn, the front yard um, of his, his DNA building. And there's another video I saw where um, he actually makes a statement, I heard he made the statement often, that if we as humans are not willing to play God, who is? Uh, because I think a lot of people have questioned the technology uh, within DNA science, uh, uh, the technology that allows certain scientists to control certain aspects of human and biological existence because of their ability to manipulate uh, DNA. I think that Watson takes the side of, hey, DNA science is us playing God and we should own that. Maurice Wilkins, on the other hand, realized, especially vis-a-vis especially -vis or juxtaposed to his role in the Manhattan Project, the DNA science and technology could be just as much of a, um, uh, of a disaster and a weapon against humanity. Why do I say this? Well, we have to look at how medicine has been evil. Um, before DNA technology was something to be talked about, um, we had this whole era of eugenics. Now, if we go back to the slide, mind you, Maurice Wilkins was stuck between this notion of negative eugenics um, and what became known as positive eugenics later on during the era of DNA. People started describing, especially in the 60s, DNA as this thing, as this element, as this science, as this technology that could positively impact human beings as opposed to eugenics projects in the past that negatively uh, affected or killed or destroyed or, committed or created genocide in certain populations. Now, what do I mean by that negative eugenics? Well, negative eugenics was illustrated well in North Carolina. If you look at the graph on the right, and this was obtained uh, from a, um, a North Carolina library source, um, if you look at the cumulative sterilizations in North Carolina between the end of the uh, uh, World War II and 1963, and those years after, you know, Hitler had been officially defeated and um, his his Nazi regime and his genocide and his Holocaust of um, Jewish people and other desirables had sort of ended. Um, between the years when that ended in, in 1963, about 20 years or so, state experiments um, in sort of manipulating the sterility, the ability for humans to, to be birthed, were, were not slowing down in the United States. Um, so various states like North Carolina, Virginia, I think Iowa was another state, very were very, uh, have recognized more recently uh, in the last decade or so that they were very much part of uh, state-sanctioned sterilization projects uh, that between the end of World War II and uh, the early 1960s in North Carolina killed about, or sterilized 5,000 men and women. Uh, that means that it didn't allow that man or woman to be able to create another child, which was a, uh, a, a holocaust of its own. Now, if you combine all the states, uh, and, and especially if you combine this with the Tuskegee experiments that were facilitated by the federal government, the U.S., I think, Public Health Department. Um, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people, mostly African American and Native American people who were either given STDs and infected permanently or kept from being able to create, to procreate, and, and to create their own lineage. Um, so, yes, so you have to look at this in historical context. By 1957, American Indians had the right to vote. They were full American citizens. But between World War II and the late 50s, early 60s, um, 
you had major projects not only to move Native Americans out of certain locations in the United States and to keep them sort of in their political place, there were a lot of projects to make Native Americans invisible, to destroy them, to keep them from procreating. And then, ironically, more recently, in, in the last 20 or 30 years, you have people who are not Native American looking at Native Americans and saying, you know, how many of there are you? You know, where are you from? You know, do you enter a conversation with people as a Native American, and I'm Lumbee Indian, do you enter a conversation with people and say, hey, yes, we were, we were kept from procreating. That's why there's not a lot of us. It's not that we suddenly disappeared in history. You know, those are awkward conversations, but conversations that we sort of have to have. Thus my sign, uh, where I sedated that I am the, um, the uh, survivor of the first Holocaust. American Indians, since uh, pretty much the early 1800s, have been genocidally, um, in, in holy cause terms, massacred, limited, kept from breeding, uh, and to such an extent that we have to acknowledge that this is our own sort of American Holocaust. Now, in terms of historical sort of anecdotes, Hitler, Adolf Hitler, stated that his reason for, or his justification for, for killing Jewish people and other undesirables, quote unquote, in Europe, uh, was the Native American genocide in the United States. He said this in one of his books that he wrote or helped write. Um, and he was very adamant that the United States had willingly killed Native Americans, thus he, as the leader of the Nazi regime, should be able to kill uh, Jewish people and other undesirables. So, oh, and this last point, um, this is sort of why we had to make a point in the professional health care education, to allow people to see themselves as connected to certain communities. Uh, we make appeals for diversity and inclusion and admissions, for getting certain unrepresented people in certain communities to become doctors and nurses and PAs and other types of health professionals. Well, it's because, the reason why we must do that is because the, there's people who are still from that era of, 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 of United States sanctioned um, genocide or holocaust who themselves are, in terms of their children and, and lineage, have maintained this unwillingness to trust healthcare. We wonder why, especially black men um, and, 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 and a lot of Native American people in general don't want to go to seek healthcare. Uh, they don't trust the healthcare system. They don't think that the information they are obtaining from them is for their benefit. Now, this may not be obvious knowledge for them, but I think there's this kind of subconscious sort of resistance to um, to, to the things that, um, to healthcare because of the things that they and their family have experienced, again, over the last 50 to 100 years. Um, so yes, we, we have to make sure in interprofessional healthcare that we're emphasizing um, the connectedness between the people who are suffering, suffering these historical legacies of discrimination and, 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 and sterilization, other types of genocide, um, and, the, and the people from the community who are most willing and most able culturally, politically, um, and I'll say racially, to connect with these people and make them feel that health care matters for them. Um, so yes, let's get into sort of a discussion of, of how medicine and, and health care are, are sort of need to be or have been and need to be indicted in, in this conversation. Um, I look at medical school, as I say here, as the locus of eugenics and genocide and other things, however you want to describe it, in the United States. Here you see that Wake Forest University in North Carolina um, sponsored a uh, eugenics conference. Uh, now, there were rumors uh, in North Carolina that, and this came from various sources, again, just rumors, I will say that, uh, that Wake Forest helped sanction um, um, experiments that utilized Native American people uh, um, um, in the western part of North Carolina. Now, if this happened on a large scale, I don't know, uh, but people who were not Native American, who were actually physicians, who knew the Wake Forest community well, uh, basically stated according to other people. Again, this is kind of hearsay, but again, there's some factualness to it. Um, they sort of admitted that this had taken place, especially in the era between 1940 and 1950, especially 1950 when Native Americans began to uh, really connect with this growing Wake Forest um, healthcare system. 
um, in North Carolina. And they, again, it may have been the 60s, but my timing is not correct because, again, I didn't get many details. But again, Wake Forest here, especially as this kind of web, as, as this website shows, sort of acknowledges their part in it and the kind of um, in the eugenics project. Um, but they also, as a, as a system, as a university, um, have certain secrets within their house within the university. Uh, some secrets that a lot of people in the university community probably don't know at this historical moment. Uh, so, but yes, if we if we if we if we let that sit out there sort of abstractly um, as rumor, um, we have to sort of acknowledge that there's some truth to that, and that people are sort of saying these things because at the very least um, they were alienated and, and victims of a form of eugenics that Wake Forest and other healthcare uh, medical schools and healthcare institutions helped um, maintain during the early 20th century. Now, um, here I must stop and state with sort of a sense of vigor that the power of DNA, sort of that notion that DNA is this science that houses within it this power of, of truth, uh, can't overcome the fact that medicine and science are highly subjective endeavors. Um, we can see that more, m most generally with people who are now mapping their family history genetically. They, they found cousins and relatives and of all sorts um, through genetic re reading of their genetic material, certain chromosomes, certain markers. Um, but we still, as the educational community, have to, have to kind of back up and, and kind of emphasize that sort of the sense of truth and of agency that is found in DNA technology and knowledge can't overcome the fact that medicine and science, as, as, as things practiced by human beings, as people who, by people who have certain prejudices, certain bi prejudices, certain biases, certain flaws, creates a medicine and science that is highly subjective across the board. So that's my general statement there. Now, we begin to understand this, and if I can return to MIT for a bit, we, we, we begin to understand this within the context of um, who bears the burden of knowledge production and educational sort of importance uh, throughout the United States. A good example of sort of what I'm talking about here is Professor James Shirley. Uh, Dr. Shirley was educated at Johns Hopkins. He received his PhD and MD. And um, when I, as I was telling you, I took a couple years off from MIT and when I returned, um, I was in a actually a medical anthropology class and Dr. Shirley was invited in to speak uh, during the first few weeks of class, if I'm not mistaken, about his work. Dr. Shirley's work s sort of uh, argued, or he argued uh, within the context of his work, that human gen genome research did not need embryonic genetic material to do the work that was idolized or that was kind of pr proposed by scientists. Essentially, he was arguing that adult stem cells uh, were enough uh, to help continue um, medical research that was informed by DNA science. Um, he became the center of a bit of controversy over that, and I'm not sure how MIT reacted to that knowledge. Um, I heard rumors being there, that, um, and I think he indicated that he was on the edge or on the bleeding edge, or the kind of on the critical edge um, of this knowledge, this building of knowledge of DNA and genomic um, medical advancement, or medical advances in using genomic uh, science. Um, but he, he ironically, at the same time that he was sort of pushing the larger scientific community to kind of the medical community to step away from uh, genomic research using embryonic stem cells, uh, he also came up for tenure. At MIT, now the case of his tenure, uh, as it is most universities, is closed. Um, but what I find interesting is that um, there was a strong correlation between the timing of his um, extra, the timing of his statements about the need to step away from NIH funding that used embryonic, that supported embryonic stem cells, um, and the kind of his professional identity at MIT. If you notice here, the picture on the right, which the picture on the left is, is Dr. Shirley, the picture on the right shows a hallway full of people, I think some of them are journalists, who met with Shirley 
uh, and I think it, this was in 2007, if I'm not mistaken, who met Shirley in the hallway at MIT, which is, if you see the door on the left, it's the president's office at MIT. Uh, they met Dr. Shirley in the hallway um, as he went, as he was undergoing or put, putting himself through a 12 day, if I'm not mistaken, it might have been 10 day, but I think it was a 12 day hunger strike. He eventually ended it at 10 or 12 days, but he wrote a series of articles to the MIT newspaper, The Tech, and to other, um, and to other uh, news outlets, new, new media outlets, about the importance of why he was being sort of, uh, as we say in some areas, land blasted or, or um, uh, singled out um, for his racial identity in the midst of his tenure here. Now, uh, what some of us speculated as undergrads and grad students at MIT was that his arguments about embryonic stem cells, about our not needing embryonic stem cells, helped play a part in his, the decision for him not to gain tenure. Again, only he could speak to that, only certain people in the know would, would know that. Uh, but I find it interesting. I think a lot of people in my, in, in my educational community found it interesting that sort of relatively at the same time he was really an advocate for the, the dismissal of funding, of NIH funding, based on embryonic stem cell research, he was sort of ousted. He was denied tenure at MIT. Um, and I want to show you this. It, I think it is on purpose. You know, again, we see here his, um, Dr. Shirley's whiteboard. Um, if you can see my mouse, Dr. Shirley's whiteboard to the left of his head. Um, there's DNA again. You know, you can look at the context of this board, which I've taken some classes, and again in biology and biochemistry at MIT. And you know, this is the language of sort of what was going on at that time in the mid uh, middle of the first decade of the 21st century. So again, this is MIT. This is the debate on stem cell research and, and sort of the after aftermath of DNA sequencing. sequencing. Uh, and this is also about race. So we have all three of those sort of topics caught up in this conversation. So anyway, after Dr. Shirley was denied tenure, there was a fallout, a fallout at MIT. I think, a, I think a couple faculty members actually left MIT. I think one or two members of the corporation, which is MIT's board of trustees, left. Um, MIT had a reputation to keep, and they made that known to students and anybody asking that, you know, they were the place of objective sort of critical rigorous scientific research and they had to maintain their reputation um, a lot of people sort of said you know given the whole racial connotation here that the, the fact that James Shirley was one of maybe two or three tenure track or tenured black faculty in the sciences at MIT um, the fact that he was a national spokesperson against gen, um, embryonic stem cell research uh, as opposed to adult stem cell research. Um, all of these things together created a context uh, for people in the, around the community to say that MIT continued to um, maintain certain um, racial and intellectual um, landscapes uh, at, the, at the institution, at the university. Um, again, a, um, former assistant to President Chuck Vest uh, Clarence Williams is, I think, in the process of writing another book. Uh, he's written one or two before on the experience of black um, scholars at MIT. Um, one story I read, I read his first book, which is very thick. It was it's full of stories. One of his, his first book, one of the stories, um, one of the stories in his first book is about a faculty member at, at, at well, he was at MIT, I think, in his early career, but he's a physicist. And he eventually went to Johns Hopkins and received tenure. Uh, but when he was at MIT, he was arguing and he stated that, you know, the peer review process was not entirely, uh, it was not objective at all. It was very subjective. It was based on certain people knowing your research and keeping you out of their ranks. So, you know, as much as we want to think the science and medicine are objective spaces, we really have to consider how subjective, how at times racist science and medicine is what kind of a, you know in terms of the, the political landscape in terms of the people the bodies the physical the phenotypes that we have in the schools uh, it is a it is a very it tends to be a racist place and um, we can't deny that and we have to sort of own that uh, in terms of our coming coming into medicine and coming to science and, and trying to find out like what is the what is the landscape and how do we try to understand it
Now, one of my friends, one of my acquaintances, he was a young, uh, he was a black male. He graduated with me, uh, ended up getting his MD, PhD. Uh, he made a statement um, to me when we were talking, when I was sort of considering what I would say during this lecture. Um, I asked him about his research, and he does, you know, biology, and he, he has MD, but he does, like, biophysical sort of stuff, um, biophysics sort of stuff. He was telling me that he stopped trying to create an environment that is not racist. He said he was trying to find a space wherever he's at to remain unmolested and to do his research. And I thought those were very strong words, and I, and I, and, and I want to sort of state them here. He said that he wanted to remain unmolested. Um, and I believe for people of color, for black people, for American Indians, for Latino people, in the sciences and in medicine, uh, to different degrees, health care remains. The sciences remain, medicine remain, uh, places where we are easily, it can be, and sometimes are, often are in certain contexts, molested um, and, 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 and alienated and, and put asunder and, you know, whatever, whatever, the term, whatever the terminology is that you want to use. Um, and the question that I was left with, and I'll, and I'll ask that here, I, I always wondered if, if racism was sort of a, 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 sh a skin or a cover-up for a, a, the larger politics of genetic science at MIT. I don't know that. It's a question I ask. Um, I'd love to kind of create an inquiry <laughs> one day. Um, but again, we're talking about the most important of sciences at this historical moment and still today. Um, and, and certain people are trying to gain tenure, they're trying to keep their careers going, and it's a very, very touchy, politically volatile subject to, to talk about. Um, so here, in, in, in winding down through my slides here, through my lecture, we have to ask what our cure is um, for all of this. I think, especially in healthcare and in, in medicine, especially as a kind of corollary of basic sciences, we're looking for authentic communication. Now what do I mean by that? What do I mean by authentic communication? Um, we have to first and foremost acknowledge how medicine and science are often abusive. This is a long conversation. Um, you can talk about how medical students and residents are bullied, are put through a ringer, to use the language of the older folks back at home. Um, they're put through the ringer. They're they're really not tolerated well as students and as introductory healthcare uh, providers um, when they're being trained. I don't think this is so much the case in nursing, which I've heard horror stories in nursing too, um, of abuse and of, of people just using their power and authority to to dump people out of the way. Um, but I know that healthcare and and, and medicine. And, you know, and the science is the main, is the kind of nucleus of, of medicine and healthcare, uh, tend to be fairly abusive spaces. Now, case in point is this lawsuit that uh, uh, Dr. Head at UCLA won, I think about a year ago, yeah, it says July 2013 when it was published. Um, essentially, his head was superimposed onto a gorilla's body during a meeting of residents and other medical health, medical professionals. He was a tenure track faculty member at UCLA Medical School and um, again I bring up tenure again but um, he was ridiculed and racially um, segregated and made fun of and abused excuse me abused um, without warrant um, and I think if you read articles about him he approached other people um, and said, hey, you know, this isn't right. You know, I, I want to go up the chain of command, if you will. And they sort of ignored him. But yeah, he ended up winning a $4.5 million racial discrimination lawsuit um, based on this one incident where people, again, probably all white people, and we'll, we'll kind of code the, the racial um, landscape of where he was studying, even though uh, where he was working, even though we don't know what the racial makeup was. It could have been, you know, Korean folks there, or Chinese or whatever. Um, there was a context for him as a black man um, to be racialized and to be uh, treated with with indignity or with um, with a lack of dignity. Um, and understanding this is is very very critical. Um, again, there probably won't be many four point five million dollar lawsuits that are won because of racism. 
but this doesn't show there being one $4.5 million discrimination lawsuit that is one doesn't mean that other racism doesn't take place and it, it is conducive to our education it is, it is, it is quite important that we begin to have a conversation within healthcare and medical education um, about how various senses of abuse are accepted um, as we train the healer. Now, we wonder why, what this does. Well, I mean, abuse to anyone, whether in terms of racism or otherwise, creates the context for, creates the context for um, their internalizing that abuse for their internalizing that abuse and later on exercising it in obvious or not so obvious ways on other people um, again this is a longer conversation which I would love to have um, and and I will be having in various contexts here at the university um, but you know Understanding what it means to be abused, what, understanding what it means to be bullied, understanding what it means to be ridiculed in, in sort of not non-professional ways um, within the healthcare medical context is highly critical um, as we move ahead to try to fix healthcare disparities because you cannot heal the healer, which I've written an uh, article to AMC um, um, using that title. We cannot heal the healer until, I mean, we cannot heal the sick until we heal the healer. We cannot heal the sick until we heal the healer, and I think that's very critical for us to understand um, going forward. Um, now, here at Rosalind Franklin, in particular, we have this notion of interprofessionalism. Um, interprofessionalism is um, basically our understanding that it is important for healthcare professionals to communicate with each other, uh, to appreciate one another, to be equitable to one another to have each other's interest in mind, to understand each other's expertise and respect them. All of those good things. But within our IP model, we, we must ask if there is room for contention. Now, what do I mean by contention? Well, let me tell you the story of this bottle of cyclomidrol. Uh, cyclomidrol is used in a lot of hospitals to dilate the eyes of patients. Now, I think it's used primarily for pediatric patients. Uh, it could be used in adults, but uh, if you're working on uh, many NICU units, or right, on a NICU unit, uh, if you have premature babies, especially, and they're, do, they're doing tests on their eyes to make sure everything uh, uh, in terms of uh, ophthalmology is, is functioning correctly, they give eye drops to dilate the eyes during these procedures. Anyway, long story short, I was working, I have, I've, I've been working in pharmacy on and off for about 12 years in various parts of the United States. Um, and, um, and I'm actually, just to contextualize sort of where I'm coming from, I'm actually writing a book. Um, on the cultures and politics of pharmacy work uh, based on over 12 years of experience in various locations. Um, but one of my experiences, which I share in this book, is based on uh, this eye drop. Um, at a hospital in North Carolina, uh, the labels for patients that were in the NICU would come out with instructions for giving these eye drops for their test. Well, what I noticed one day, again, haphazardly, and sort of it, just because I was being nosy, really, was that the eye drops were, uh, and actually it wasn't because I was nosy, I was actually, as a pharmacy technician, in charge of making sure that labels were worded correctly and that everything looked appropriate, so it was my professional obligation to do so. Um, but what I noticed in looking at these labels was that the labels indicated certain directions for giving eye drops based on the baby's race. So in one scenario, if a baby was deemed white or Caucasian, I don't know what the term was, it was either white or Caucasian, the baby got one drop. Uh, if it was, the baby was Latino or uh, Asian, I think was the term used, they got two drops. And if the baby was considered to be black or African American, they got three drops. Um, as an anthropologist, again, based on a long conversation, a long kind of list of arguments, I knew this wasn't right. It, it didn't make sense. It made no scientific sense. It made no sort of genealogical sense. It made no genetic sense because these babies weren't being typed genetically. They weren't, get, the doctors, the healthcare professionals, in this case a, a NICU physician, was not giving the babies eye drops based on some uh, scientifically um, sort of derived knowledge of the human body. They were basically saying, well, this baby is identified as, and thus we're giving so many drops to the baby. 
uh, when I, again, within this context of interprofessionalism, when I gave notice that I thought this was wrong, um, I approached pharmacists who didn't understand why the babies were getting different drops. They said that, well, maybe it's written into the medication. And I was like, well, okay. Um, later on, uh, they contacted me back after I pushed a bit and said that they had contacted the clinical staff and the NICU, and they argued that this was the methodology, the different number, numbers of drops based on race, was the methodology used by a particular physician um, who had been at the hospital a long time, who was probably going to be retiring in the next couple years, and they were just going to let it be until he retired. Well, I don't know if he retired. And I don't think they were really concerned with the numbers of eye drops being used. However, I did see that they removed this racially kind of coded language on the labels coming out of the pharmacy, which I think was a victory in my book. Um, but, you know, it, it, it didn't change how they used the medication on the NICU floor. Now, uh, later on, when I was working in another location in Washington, D.C., um, I found out that within the research on cyclomidrol, uh, there is an argument made that phenotypically black babies versus Latino Asian babies versus white babies have different pigmentation in the eyes. But again, um, I made the argument to pharmacists at this location that it had nothing to do with a baby's race and that they would have to actually make an argument about pigmentation in eyes as opposed to um, an argument about one's racial identity. Anyway, again, that was my role as an anthropologist working... Um, arguably a subaltern, working a subaltern job as a pharmacy technician. But again, within the interprofessional healthcare, we must consider how certain people uh, don't have power, how certain people have power, and how certain people sometimes or often are dismissed because uh, they supposedly don't have the expertise or the power to enforce certain um, rules or regulations in terms of um, medication. Now I put at the bottom of the slide that we can't go from hierarchy to being friends on Facebook. I think ultimately we're beginning to live in an era where everybody becomes friends on Facebook. We're all in the social media, social networking together. We all are supposedly, you know, connected. Uh, but we have endured a long history of medication, uh, medicine and healthcare being uh, done in terms of hierarchy of, of certain people possessing certain power that they do not give up and that they do not submit and that they do not submit to scrutiny uh, in other disciplines i.e. anthropology in my case uh, or i.e.g. anthropology in my case uh, but it is important here to think that or to say that you can't go think you can't think that you can go from that hierarchy that history of hierarchy in medicine and healthcare to this place where we're all just sort of getting along and interacting and being friends with each other and respecting one another there must be room where people can contend with each other they, they can have different viewpoints and that these viewpoints really can be debated I think that is that is going to be what really helps fix the future of healthcare. And again, that is a long, long conversation, which I'm more than willing to be a part of. Um, so beyond that, we have to comprehend <laughs> self-destruction in healthcare. Um, this was an article put off of the New York Times. Essentially, um, it concerns the, or it, it is about, um, it's an op-ed piece, I think by a medical student, if I'm not mistaken. Um, about sort of this epidemic and doctor suicides. Now, I don't know if it's an epidemic necessarily. I don't know what the rates of doctor suicide are, um, but I've heard a lot of stories, quite a few stories actually, uh, physicians not necessarily killing, committing suicide, but c putting themselves or being in situations where their bodies are vulnerable. For example, a doctor in a uh, resident in Texas, if I'm not mistaken, a fairly young person, a young man. Um, gave himself propofol recently, in the last probably few months, to sleep. Uh, it might have been the last year. Gave himself propofol to sleep during his clinical rotation, during the time he was responsible for patients to the hospital. Well, he gave himself too much propofol and he died. Um, so as an anthropologist, I'm sitting here saying, well, it's not, we can't just look at this as pathological. We can't look at people, look at this as, as a situation where people, certain people can't, deal with it. They can't they can't take what it what it what it um, what medicine is. They they can't endure it. They're not strong enough. You know, we can't look at it that way. We must consider this as an environmental, as a sociological, as a political, as an economic problem. Again, medical doctors uh, used to 
be forced to work very, very long hours that were not regulated. More recently, in the last maybe decade, the regulation has occurred where you know residents and medical students can only work so many hours. Uh, but again, you have different forces that affect the environment of a physician, such as insurance, uh, and how insurance agreements with insurance companies push these medical doctors to see so many patients above what they should be seeing, to work so many hours above what they should be working. I mean, even truck drivers for the last 50 years have had to maintain driving logs, but you know, still today we don't require doctors to get so much sleep and to take a certain number of hours off of work. Uh, because again, we look at physicians as being, and medical science more generally, as being this divine area, this kind of place of prestige and importance. And uh, um, you know, even if we don't give them, give physicians the prestige that they maybe deserve, uh, possibly, um, we expect them to maintain the same commitment to healing that they always have and in greater numbers. Um, so yeah, we're creating an environment, and again, a long conversation, but we are creating an environment where you will probably see more medical students, more medical residents, more medical doctors, more healthcare professionals, maybe more generally, uh, committing suicide or, or harming themselves or doing things that are, that are really a result of the intense pressure cooker, uh, environmental, political, social uh, pr pressure cooker that they're enduring um, as providers of healing, as healers themselves. Um, and lastly, um, I would have us look um, at what Ashley Montague, an anthropologist from the mid 20th century, um, was saying to, to medicine. Um, he wrote a special communication to JAMA back in the early 1960s, I think 1963. And one of his arguments that he made was about um, why, you know, about the condition of medical education. First of all, he was asking that anthropologists be included in the medical education, which I think is fantastic, which hasn't really occurred. Um, but uh, one of his most kind of stunning arguments is that he wondered why, and, and you know, this is still the case today, he wondered why medical students begin studying humanity, begin studi studying the healthcare subject with a dead body. And again, this is the case in most places. You start with the anatomy lab, you learn the, the, the conditions of, of the human body, and then somehow, some way, up through your clinical training, clerkships, your residency, and into your work and fellowship and your career, you suddenly become cognizant of the entire human being. Um, his argument was that you have to start with the living human being. You need to begin to see how a human being, spiritually, emotionally, physically, in every sense, is put together. Again, this might be the 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 the, the, uh, the mission of DO schools, osteopathic as opposed to allopathic medicine, but uh, more generally, uh, we have a medical environment um, that pays a lot of attention to the physical parameters, to the physical nature, to the, um, um, the diagnosis and the pathology of a human being and doesn't look at them kind of, kind of holistically. Um, but I think beyond the patient, um, Ashley Montague was also looking at the physician and looking at how healthcare providers, those providing healing, do not take care of themselves. Um, this is a long conversation about you know, how we both get certain people into healthcare and how we usher them out into health, uh, or get them into medical education and then usher them out into being practitioners of, of healthcare and medicine. A very important conversation. This is a very important conversation that we should have. And it begins with healthcare providers telling their stories. It begins with us conceptualizing healthcare and medicine beyond clinical practice and, and, and even beyond IP. Um, it's, it's, it's finding well for an interprofessional folks in, in a professionalism to talk to each other, uh, but what is what is the content of their conversation? Or we can look at it like this. It, in a perfect world of healthcare, if, it, if healthcare is a human skeleton or body, um, IP or IPE, interprofessionalism or interprofessional education is a skeleton. And more in-depth conversations about what people go through, about how they both enter medicine, how they interact with medicine, um, how people sort of form ideas of medicine or, or feel alienated from medicine. All of those types of things are the meat on the bone. So IP is a good start. It's a solid foundation, uh, but we must 
be willing to continue past that and have an in-depth conversation about um, what happens in medicine. We're not only restoring the humanity of the patient, we're restoring the humanity of a healthcare professional. A healthcare professional who, within a certain context, feels that it is necessary, and I'll go back to this slide, to commit suicide. Um, this is this is a very, very, very difficult conversation to have for many people. Why would you ever commit suicide and you are the healer? And for us to answer that is for us to really start digging more deeply into um, the, the problems that create the context for healthcare disparities in the United States and more generally globally, but I think it's important for us uh, to to start in our backyards where we think medicine has been perfected suddenly and I and I watch um, Atul Gawande who is an anthropo uh, well is he an anthropologist no he's a medical doctor who writes who has written books about what it means to be a doctor um, he he's one of the major advocates along with Paul Farmer the anthropologist and doctor uh, they're advocates of global health but I think it is important it is highly critical that we begin sort of restoring the dignity, the humanity of the people who uh, both are in charge of creating healthcare, educating and, and becoming students, and then the people who are practicing, uh, who are professionally in the in the in the uh, in the trenches of, of healthcare and medicine. Uh, and it goes back to Maurice Wilkins. It goes back to Rosalind Franklin. Um, it goes back to Watson and Crick and the, the antagonisms uh, surrounding. Uh, the discovery of DNA, and then it moves forward in, in time uh, to kind of provide a conclusion. It, pr it moves up into my time at MIT, into the ge genomic research, into uh, James Shirley, into sort of uh, an era now in the 21st century where we trust DNA, but we sort of are under its shadow. We know that it's telling us something, some special things about our, our existences as humans, but we are we, we realize we, we don't quite know how to articulate how we are sort of under its under its wing and, and the shadow of it and that it is becoming a very powerful presence for us. Um, and to 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 understand that or to begin to have that conversation is to become to um, is to begin to have um, an honest dialogue, a real talk if you will, um, about the conditions of healthcare, of medicine, of, of healthcare education, of medical education, of science, of scientific education, of the of the people and the institutions and the and the frameworks that that help um, maintain certain senses of, of power and of privilege and and of and of and, and, and help maintain certain vulnerability around certain peoples and populations. So uh, thank you for your time. Um, I think that is the end, and um, I hope you will. Bye bye.